The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Zylik. I am with ICF, and we are the vendor working on behalf of the sponsors of Energize Connecticut to bring these passive house trainings to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. We will be recording this training, and we will make this available afterwards. These trainings are at no cost, thanks to the sponsors of Energize Connecticut, and are a part of a partnership with Connecticut Passive House. A reminder that as part of this training and workforce development initiative, we are offering a 50% cost reimbursement for individuals pursuing either FIAS or PHI professional accreditation. So this includes the cost of the trainings and the exam, and once you become certified, we'll work with you to process the 50% cost reimbursement. So if you have any questions about the reimbursement process, please don't <clears throat> uh, hesitate to contact us. And with that, I'll pass it over to Keegan, who's also with ICF to talk about the Passive House Building Incentives. I'm on mute. Hey, good. thanks, Anna. And uh, yeah, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're happy to have you. Uh, so in addition to the no cost educational training series, uh, the and the prof professional accreditation reimbursements, the sponsors of Energize Connecticut also offer incentives for builders and developers who choose to pursue passive house certification in multifamily uh, residential projects with five units or more. Uh, the Passive House Incentive Design uh, is shown here on the slide. It includes pre-construction incentives for things like feasibility studies and energy modeling and post-construction incentives for full Passive House certification for the building. Our goal is that everyone involved in multifamily construction in the state of Connecticut is aware of these incentives and, and able to capitalize them, uh, capitalize on them. So for anyone interested in learning more, please visit our website or you can contact us directly at the information at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and as far as uh, today's uh, training, uh, if there are questions during today's session, please feel free to use the question, uh, the chat function uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel and Anna and I will relay them to uh, our speaker today. Who is Adam Romano? Adam, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much, Keegan. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, as avatar advertised, we're gonna be talking about heat pump water heating design and installation best practices for the next hour or so. Um, before we jump into the presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a principal building systems consultant with Stephen Winner Associates. I've been with the firm for almost four years, uh, but I've been in the energy um, efficiency engineering space uh, for about 17 years. Um, I spent a lot of my time uh, delivering workforce out of education, but I also spent a lot of my time looking at you know, new systems, um, refrigerant-based systems um, for, you know, the purpose of electrification in buildings. Um, so uh, today we're going to get into all of that and with the lens on domestic water heating uh, for, for our homes and buildings. A little bit about Stephen Winter Associates. Um, we are a research consulting and advisory firm, uh, and our goal is to make buildings perform better. And we do this for commercial buildings, multifamily buildings, um, for both private and, and public clients. Um, and we do this through a variety of services. Um, so we have energy conservation and management services. We have sustainability consulting, green building certification, accessibility consulting, as well as uh, workforce development and training. Uh, we have offices uh, in New York City, Washington, D.C., Norwalk, Connecticut, and Boston, Massachusetts, and our website is here at the bottom of the slide, um, swinter.com. So if you have any time uh, on your hands, uh, take a look at the research uh, section of our website. There's a lot of great information there about research projects that we've done and uh, case studies and things like that. So a lot of the, the training that I'm going to be delivering today is based on a lot of the research work that we've done and some of the implementation work. So definitely when you have a chance check that out. So as all of you know, there's a, you know, a big, you know, sort of push for electrification in buildings. And those of you that are working in Passive House, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to move towards electric-based systems. So uh, you look at uh, electrification, there's, you know, there's a big drive to find electric-based solutions that utilize, you know, a refrigerant, uh, refrigerant cycle uh, to be able to provide either space conditioning to our building or in the case we're going to talk about today, 
uh, domestic hot water production. Uh, and there's you know a variety of technology that is really coming uh, of age and, and is starting to come into the US. And we're gonna talk about those technologies. Um, and we're gonna spend a lot of time getting into some of the design and installation best practices. When it really comes to, you know, sizing, not, not so much sizing, we're, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but we'll get into a lot of, you know, so they're citing the unit, where it should be located, how to really set it up for success. So this way it can actually work correctly and it can achieve its best performance. Um, and uh, then we'll get into sort of the installation side, uh, making sure that we're following these little nuances when it comes to installing these units. And then we'll wrap up talking a little bit about um, the maintenance uh, aspects. You know, what do we need to do? Because again, it's going to be a little bit different than what we're used to in our homes. You know, we have standalone water heaters a lot of times um, that don't really require a ton of maintenance. So we're going to spend some time talking about some of the maintenance aspects to make sure that um, that knowledge is transferred to the end user so they understand what they need to do uh, to make sure that the, we see this continued performance uh, with these units. So our learning objectives for today, we're gonna to discuss um, the major considerations when electrifying domestic hot water. We're gonna talk about how a heat pump domestic hot water systems operate. Uh, we'll get into two different types and we'll talk about where they can be applied and sort of again, how to set them up for success. And then we'll talk uh, through a lot of, you know, through the implementation work, through our research work, we've you know found you know a lot of common installation pitfalls um, and issues that you know you want to try to avoid when you're working with your contractor to make sure that these systems are implemented well. Um, so we're going to go over those as well to make sure everyone has a good grasp on uh, what needs to be done and, and make sure that we don't you know uh, fall uh, you know sort of um, you know captive to those pitfalls. So. Let's jump in with uh, starting with you know system design, sizing, and selection. So, like anything else, like any other system that we're going to you know uh, put into a building, we're going to really make sure that we understand the design re requirements. You know what um, what does this unit need to serve? How big is the you know the building or the home? Uh, so we need to gather all of those um, those considerations and all that information to make sure that we're making the best you know sort of decision as to what system we're going to install. Um, we also want to make sure that it it is um, you know really meeting the customer's goals as well. So not only the design goal, but we want to make sure that you know the customer um, is happy with you know what we're providing. So we need to understand you know what are the motivations. You know is it um, to uh, achieve cost savings? You know maybe you're in an area where there's a high percentage of delivered fuels, and we have um, you know electric-based domestic hot water systems that are running off of electric resistance, and we want to try to find a way to generate cost savings uh, by installing these newer systems. Um, that could be a motivator for our clients. Um, it could be environmental impacts that could be a motivator as we're trying to transition towards a clean electric grid. Um, you know, there's definitely uh, an, an advantage here to take, you know, uh, to when we look at electric based domestic hot water production. So, again, all those things that, you know, we all if you know, have, have done in the past, we want to make sure that we're doing that. Now, just like, you know, you are, you know, when you're looking at um, you know, space conditioning, right? One of the, the foundational principles, you know, when it comes to, you know, providing space conditioning to a, a space is to really, and, a lot, and those of you who've been past the bus understand this, is to really scrutinize the load. And we really want to make sure that we make the building as efficient as possible so that we can put in the smallest unit that we need. We don't want to incur a high first cost, you know, and put in a larger system uh, because we have, you know, a, a building enclosure that may not be optimized. So just like we would, you know, sort of, you know, really scrutinize the enclosure and all the connection details between uh, assemblies, um, we're going to do the same thing with domestic hot water. But here we're going to be looking at fixtures, right? We're going to be looking at the things that's going to drive um, the domestic hot water load. And you know, what's going to drive the load is going to be the flow rates of the fixtures, what we can actually control. We can control that. We can't control how long someone's gonna take a shower, but we can control the fixture that you know they are utilizing to take that shower. So what are the things that we wanna make sure of before we get into the, the sizing aspect of this um, is to really make sure that the flow rates of the fixtures that we're specifying um, that we have control over or we can influence, uh, that information is being you know, brought to the customer or you know, we're you know, selecting that as part of an overall design. So we want to make sure, again, the flow rates are low. Um, and, you know, there's a variety of fixtures that are available to achieve uh, these listed flow rates. And these are kind of the flow rates that we've recommended uh, for our energy efficiency projects. Um, when we're looking at, you know, green building certification, we want to try to, again, have the lowest flows possible, but we, want, but we want to kind of stay out of this complaint zone. So there, you know, there's ways where we can really get the flow rates down uh, to, you know, half a gallon per minute in residences, but 
we find, you know, through evaluation and, and you know, sort of, you know, post installation, installation, you know, sort of interviews that, you know, that really does generate, you know, a couple of complaints. So our recommendations for, you know, sinks, things that are going to be consuming hot water is going to be a gallon uh, per minute for bathroom sinks. And then for showers and kitchens, we want to get down up to uh, our gallon and a half uh, per minute. Uh, that's going to be our you know, sort of design flow rates uh, that we want to see. And that can really, again, help reduce the domestic hot water load um, and make sure that uh, we don't have to, you know, sort of really, you know, sort of accommodate a much larger load. And, you know, there are a variety of, you know, fixtures that are out there to achieve those flow rates. Um, you know, low flow fixtures have been around for a very long time. Uh, you know, early, you know, low flow fixtures you know, that were introduced, let's say, 15 years ago, uh, 17 years ago when I started my career weren't the greatest performers um, in terms of velocity and, you know, just overall performance. Yes, the flow rates were lower, but there were some complaints about, you know, that there wasn't enough pressure. Um, but the new low flow fixtures that are out there are much better. Um, they've been uh, re-engineered uh, and can really uh, provide those listed flow rates um, and still maintain the performance that, you know, most folks have grown accustomed to. Um, so those are out there. Take a look um, at, you know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of, you know, options that are in the market. Um, we want to, but that's one of the things that we kind of want to emphasize right at the, the start, just like we would, you know, um, uh, improve or sort of, you know, optimize the enclosure. We're going to do the same thing with water consumption before we get into the design and selection. Now, when it comes to, um, you know, design selection, there's a lot of resources that are out there. I've listed a few here, and don't worry about jotting all this down. Uh, the slide deck will be made available, so you can uh, click those hyperlinks and head over to those, um, those research uh, studies that are here, the Evaluation of Performance Selection and Quality Guide, um, and, um, you know, how to install these in new and existing homes. Uh, but there's a lot of resources out there, and we're going to be utilizing, you know, these resources um, and the lessons learned from uh, these, uh, these studies uh, as, as we go through this presentation uh, this afternoon. So when we're talking about um, heat pump based domestic hot water you know, appliances, you know, a lot of them are, you know, are gonna be utilizing a vapor compression cycle. Um, and the vapor compression cycle is very similar to what you find um, in your space conditioning uh, you know, appliances. The, the, the heat pumps that we're utilizing to provide space conditioning are utilizing a similar vapor compression cycle with the refrigerant. The refrigerant may be different. A lot of cases it is 134A as opposed to 410A, um, but uh, you know, the process is still the same. So we still have you know, a, you know, uh, an area that we're absorbing heat from um, so in this case, that's going could be the outside, that could be the ambient air inside of the home or inside of the building. Uh, we have some sort of evaporator that is there that is, um, you know, sending a refrigerant through. That refrigerant is moving through that evaporator. It's absorbing heat. It's transferring into a a vapor. It's you know we're absorbing a lot of latent heat. Uh, as that absorption takes place, you know, we're cooling the airstream that is, you know, moving through that evaporator. Uh, and then once we have this refrigerant that is, you know, boiled off essentially, and it's turned into a gas, it, it's superheated to some level, um, it's going to go through the compressor. As it moves through the compressor, we're going to compress that refrigerant, and that the act of compression is also going to add a lot of heat energy to the refrigerant itself. And now this, you know, high temperature, high pressure gas is going to leave, and it's going to go out to the rejection area, right, so out to the condenser. And that condenser, a lot of times in our, you know, in our um, our, our heat pump water heaters is going to be a, a volume of water. We're going to be rejecting heat to that volume of water. And as we reject that heat to that water, the water is going to obviously get warmer uh, and that refrigerant is going to cool off. And it's going to, uh, we're going to desuperheat it, bring it back down to its boiling point. Then we're going to condense that refrigerant into a liquid. And then we're typically going to subcool that liquid a little bit uh, below its boiling point before it heads back towards the evaporator. Um, and before it does that, uh, we has to go through an expansion device. We have to drop the pressure because, you know, the refrigerant coming out of the condenser is still going to be fairly high pressure. And we need to bring that pressure back down so that we can uh, go ahead and allow that refrigerant to cool down 
through this, you know, restriction process, uh, through this flashing process, and then uh, become, you know, a, a sponge again so that it can go ahead and uh, absorb heat from that absorption zone at that evaporator. And again, this is how, you know, these systems are going to operate. And again, it's very similar to what we are, uh, we see with our um, space conditioning appliances. It's just that we're matching the pressures and the temperatures of the refrigerant to our, our application. Um, so we're still going to be, you know, absorbing a lot of heat uh, from our, our air, but then we have to reject that heat at a high temperature so that we can heat up our water to our desired temperature level. Uh, but again, we're going to be utilizing this basic uh, vapor compression cycle on most of our, our do uh, domestic water heating devices. So now that we understand how that process works, um, let's talk a little bit about the different types of systems that are out there. So the first one we're going to talk about is a integrated heat pump water heater. And um, as the term suggests, it's integrated. There's, you know, the refrigeration component and the volume of water are together in one package. And it looks, you know, very similar to what we would find, um, you know, looking at it, you know, this uh, picture here, it's very similar to a standalone water heater that may be electric, you know, resistive, you know, uh, supplied or maybe gas fired uh, or it could be oil fired. You know, there's a lot of standalone water heating devices that are around and and this kind of you know uh, mimics that design, uh, which is great from a, a space consideration standpoint because you know you want to kind of make sure that that heat pump in a retrofit uh, application can fit into the space that we're designing for. Uh, in a new construction pro tra project, we have a lot more sort of say as to where they're going, but uh, again, it kind of you know fits with the conventional space that is allowed for these mechanical devices. Um, so this is you know how they look, and they could be sited you know in a basement. They could be sited in a closet it like this on the left hand side again we have um, options to you know where these units can go um, we'll talk a little bit about the considerations when citing these units in a couple of minutes uh, but we do have some flexibility as to where these units can be installed the way these units work uh, again we're utilizing that vapor compression cycle and you can see the refrigeration component of this particular device is up at the top right so that top section is where a lot of the refrigeration um, process takes place so you can see the evaporator is up there, which is absorbing heat. We have the compressor up there, which is generating the pressure uh, for that refrigerant. And what happens here with these units is that, you know, typically they're going to be sited indoors. Um, and as they are sited indoors, they're going to uh, absorb heat from the ambient air. So, you know, you're going to have, you know, 68, 70 degree air uh, being pulled into the unit via that fan that is uh, installed right in the middle. So it's going to be pulling air in as it pulls air in with all that heat energy, that air is then going to be blown across that evaporator coil, which you see on the right-hand side. And again, that refrigerant is going to absorb that heat, right, from that air that's being blown across. It's going to turn into a vapor and it's going to work its way towards the compressor. That air stream that has now been, you know, sort of get, uh, has given up its heat energy is now going to be cooled. Uh, and that is then going to be sent out on the discharge side of the unit, which you can see on the right hand side. So you're going to be have, you know, warm air coming in and you're going to be having cold air, you know, being discharged on the opposing side of that particular unit. Now, there is a condensate drain there as well. So, you know, that, uh, that you know, evaporator coil, uh, you know, when it's operating is going to be very cold, right? Because the idea is that it's trying to absorb heat from that airstream. So it needs to be colder than that airstream. Uh, and, you know, when that evaporator coil is operating in an environment where maybe the dew point is, you know, at or below that particular evaporator temperature, um, then we will generate some condensate. We will condense uh, the, the, the moisture inside of the air on that evaporator coil. So we need to make provisions to deal with that condensate, you know, when it does take place, right? As same thing with an air conditioner, when it's operating in cooling mode uh, to heat, you know, to cool your home, uh, it is also going to dehumidify the air. So these units are going to do the same thing. So again, we have to have provisions for you know, draining out that condensate uh, when it's produced. And then as that heat is, you know, sort of that the heat in that refrigerant, it goes into the compressor. Again, we're going to compress that uh, refrigerant. We're going to generate additional heat through the compression process. And then we're going to send that gas out into the condenser, which is inside of that volume of water there. Um, so that water is going to absorb the heat. It's going to condense that uh, refrigerant back into a liquid. Um, and now our tank is going to be nice and warm. And we're going to have hot water that we can utilize inside of our home. Uh, 
Now you also do see another element inside there. That element is electric resistive, um, and that is there as a backup, um, or it is there as um, you know, sort of an additional heating source uh, if we have a, a need for a very high recovery. Um, so let's say that you know a lot of showers are taking place at once. Um, it's Thanksgiving. Everyone is over. We're doing a lot of cooking. We have a lot of people over the home, um, and everyone is you know is doing that. Uh, you know, using a lot of hot water, we have that backup there to help you know increase the recovery or decrease the recovery time, so that we can also always make sure that we're maintaining um, hot water in the the building. But that's kind of how these these work. Um, they're utilizing again either R134A. Sometimes they use 410A. Um, though most of them are utilizing uh, 134A as the refrigerant to uh, to uh, sort of run this process. So that's that's one type, right? The other type we're going to talk about is a split uh, heat pump water heater. Um, and these are becoming more popular. Um, these work a little differently. Um, so instead of being integrated where we have the refrigeration component and the tank, the volume of water connected is, is one unit, uh, now we're splitting those functions apart. So the refrigeration device now is in this case sited outdoors. So this unit uh, sits outdoors and it kind of looks just like a, a heat pump, a mini split that we would utilize for space conditioning. Um, but that is sitting out there on a pad, on a bracket, you know, however we want to install it. And again, we'll get into those uh, best practices. And then uh, what happens is cold water from the city is then being, you know, sort of pumped or piped to that uh, outdoor unit. Then that uh, water is heated through the refrigeration process that takes place inside of this outdoor unit. And then hot water is sent out to a storage tank uh, that is sited indoors. And then we will draw off that storage tank to go ahead and serve the domestic hot water load in our building. Now, these work a little bit differently. Um, uh, not only, obviously, they're, they're split apart, they're not integrated, but they also utilize a different type of refrigerant. So instead of utilizing a traditional, um, you know, refrigerant like 134A or, you know, 410A, um, here we're utilizing uh, carbon dioxide as our refrigerant. So the refrigeration process is a little bit different um, because we're utilizing CO2. So here we're, you know, doing something called, uh, it works on the transcritical cycle, which means that, you know, we're not actually condensing the carbon dioxide we're actually just we're cooling off the gas so we're absorbing heat from the outdoors we're sending that uh that co2 as a gas to the compressor that compressor is putting a lot of pressure onto that co2 it's creating a very high pressure co2 environment uh, and then we utilize a gas cooler and that's what you see here that gc uh right in the middle of that box that is actually cooling that uh carbon dioxide gas back down to a lower level so that it could go uh, and absorb more heat at the evaporator but the the components are identical in terms of having an evaporator you know a condenser is not really in this case what we have we have a gas cooler but we have a, a means to reject heat uh we have an expansion valve and we have a compressor so a lot of the you know the components are similar what's nice about these again just like the other units is that <clears throat> there's no refrigeration piping needed we're just we're connecting you know uh plumbing pipes to this outdoor unit so we don't have to worry about having a refrigeration license and dealing with evacuation and charging <clears throat> and all those good things, excuse me, we are, we are just sending water connections, you know, you know, just MPT pipe thread to those outdoor, that outdoor unit to provide the heat to that tank. <clears throat> the way the process works is that there's a, a thermistor inside of the tank. You can see TH1 there sitting inside that purple tank. Um, and what that is doing is indicating to the unit when the temperature drops. So as we start to consume uh, hot water in the building, the temperature of the tank is going to drop. And as it does, we are going to turn that unit on to provide uh, more heat uh, to that tank, more hot water to that tank. So these uh, also are a um, an option when it comes to refrigerant based heat pump water heaters and we're going to get into some of the the aspects of the installation process with these as well so on the integrated side what affects performance well there's a couple things that uh, affects uh performance when we're looking at the integrated tanks and you know one of the things obviously is going to be the ambient temperature if we site this integrated heat pump water heater in a cold environment, in a cold basement during the winter, um, it's going to be a lot harder for that unit to absorb heat from that cold air. So that's going to affect the performance of the unit. Uh, we're going to consume more electricity. The unit's going to run for longer periods of time. Uh, and we may have a higher um, sort of um, a reliance on our electric resistive backup to provide uh, you know, adequate uh, uh, domestic hot water temperatures. 
it can also depend on the ambient relative humidity in the same light, uh, the temperature of the water coming into the, the unit. When it, during the winter time, the water temperature from the city is going to be a little bit cooler because the outside environment is colder. Um, so we're gonna require a larger temperature rise. Uh, that can also affect um, the performance. Uh, and then the water draw, draw uh, profile. How, um, how, do, how do these you know, units, how are they being used um, in terms of the end user? You know, do we see a lot of concentrated draws um, or are the draws kind of taking place over long periods of time? And we'll, and we'll get into that. So what we did with uh, this you know, particular uh, graph here is we started to um, monitor these 14 different uh, integrated heat pump water heaters. And there are links to the full study and those uh, slides that we uh, sort of introduced this section with. Um, but the idea is we wanted to understand, you know, what affects performance, you know, let's monitor everything. We put CTs on all of the components. We wanted to know how much energy are these units uh, drawing, how much are they consuming, and then, you know, what is going to be affecting uh, that performance. And what we found is the two biggest, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of things that affect um, the performance is going to be the hot water use, uh, you know, the usage pattern. And what we see here on the graph on the left is we're looking at um, the, a couple different things. We're looking at um, how much water is being used. That is in the blue uh, in line there in that line graph. Uh, we're looking at the energy from the heat pump. So how much uh, energy is being consumed uh, from the heat pump portion of that water heater that's in green. And then we're looking at how much energy is being uh, consumed through the electric resistive backup, because there's times when that electric resistive backup has been energized, and that we're looking at at watt hours. And we're looking at this over the course of a couple of a couple of days, right? And what we see at the top is that there is sort of a direct relationship between the overall sort of daily coefficient of performance, you know, how you know efficient was is this unit, and the draw profile. On days where we had a lot of concentrated draws, where you know everyone woke up and took you know ten minute showers, you know right after another in succession, you know our draw profile went up, right? So you can see that blue line on the twenty third uh, is very very high. Uh, we can see that we utilized twenty five gallons, uh, you know, in, during that instantaneous period of time. So when the draw profile is really really high, the heat pump you know is operating full out trying to bring that 50 degree water in, heat it up to 120 so it can go out to the building. And it may need to rely on that electric resistive backup a lot more when the draws are very concentrated like that. Uh, and that's what you see here with that spike in, uh, in electrical consumption in the red is that you know it really coincides with those concentrated draws. And because we're utilizing electric resistive backup, you know, the efficiency of that is, you know, is one. We have, you know, a you know, direct, uh, you know, sort of one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of energy that goes in and the amount of energy that we get out. And that is going to be, you know, definitely lower than our refrigeration coefficient of performance. So our daily COP is going to suffer because we're utilizing a lot of electric resistive backup. Um, and you can see that happen right on that day. That day we consumed 57 gallons in total, uh, but the COP was one of 1.4. Now, if the you know draws are spread out, you know we can use more water. But if we spread them out a little bit better, then you know our COP improves. You can see the next day we uh, and even the following day we consumed a lot more water, 76 gallons in total, 92 gallons in total. But our coefficient of performance was a lot higher than uh, that day when we consumed 57 gallons because of that concentrated draw. So if we can space out. Um, you know, our, you know, our water utilization, uh, then we can help that unit recover a lot better and not have to utilize a lot of electric resistive backup to, uh, to make sure that we don't run out of hot water. So that's one of the things when it comes to, you know, sort of usage and some of the knowledge transfer to the end user is really making sure that that is kind of communicated that we want to have those, you know, longer, you know, spread out periods of, of utilization so that we don't have these high, these uh, high draws where we have this high um, sort of, you know, reliance on electric resistive. The same thing on the right hand side, this is now showing ambient temperature in relation to um, the electric resistive utilization. So we can see here uh, the inlet temperature is in blue. So that's the temperature of the air coming into the evaporator. And over the course of the day, it's going to change as you know the day, uh, day warms up and overnight it cools down. So you see this kind of you know sine wave, this kind of roller coaster there in terms of the temperature differentials in this particular basement. And what you see on in the red there is the heat pump energy. So the energy going to the heat pump, to the compressor and the fan. 
Uh, and then you see in green is the lower element. This is now the energy going to the electric resistive element. And you could see again when the temperatures drop, when we get down to you know below 46 degrees, we see that we're utilizing more of that um, that electric resistive. The heat pump can't you know make that temperature rise you know uh, reality and is reliant on that uh, electric resistive backup to bring the temperature up to something that is you know adequate for the building. So that's another, you know, sort of uh, indicator and, you know, what affects performance is, you know, not only is it the draw pattern, the usage, you know, pattern, it's now also, you know, where we're citing these units. And, you know, if we're not in a space where we have a lot of excess heat uh, that we can harvest to produce hot water, um, we can have, again, a high utilization of that electric resistive backup, which is going to, again, affect our overall COP. Uh, and that's going to go down uh, pretty dramatically. So those are the two things. And when we get into uh, citing these units, we'll talk a lot more about, you know, what's adequate. Now with the, um, the split heat pump water heaters, uh, what's going to affect performance with those is going to be a couple different things. Obviously, outdoor air temperature is going to affect, you know, performance a little bit. So as the, the temperature does decrease out doors, you know, our COP is going to degree, decrease as well, just like it would on your traditional um, space conditioning heat pumps, right? Uh, it becomes harder and harder to harvest heat from the outside when the temperatures drop down to 20, 10, zero degrees, right? Um, we can still maintain capacity, which is a little bit different with our uh, integrated units. The integrated units, when the temperature dropped, we had a reliance on our electric resistive backup. Here with uh, the split heat pump water heaters, we're still maintaining capacity um, even though the temperature is dropping we're just utilizing more electricity to to meet, meet that capacity right we're just running the compressor you know a much faster speed in order for us to harvest heat at you know 20 10 degrees uh, to provide the amount of heat output that we need um, so that's one thing obviously that's going to affect um, the capacity of these units is going to be or the performance is going to be the ambient temperature outdoors which is going to be you know sort of a wide swing um, you know, indoor temperatures, you know, are very narrow in terms of what we typically see in buildings, uh, but outdoor temperatures definitely vary widely depending on the season. Um, so um, that is going to be one uh, sort of, um, you know, factor that's going to affect performance. Another one that affects performance with these split heat pump water heaters is um, incoming water temperature. Um, so the way that CO2 works as a refrigerant, it really likes to see a big delta T. Um, it likes to take very cold water in and make it very, very hot. And as that delta T starts to get lower and lower, um, it becomes harder for that unit to give up its heat energy um, and the efficiency starts to drop. And that's what we're seeing here on the graph on the top right hand corner is the heat pump inlet water temperature compared to the coefficient of performance. How efficient is that unit? And you can see when the in inlet heat pump water temperature, the, the water coming to the, the heat pump is at 60 degrees or 50 degrees, our COP is great. We're at four and a half, you know, even higher than four and a half, close to five when the, when the water temperature coming into the heat pump is really low. When we start to increase that water temperature to 70, to 80, to 90, we're starting to see you know, a decrease in COP. We're starting to see an in, uh, increase in the amount of electrical consumption. Uh, we're starting to see that it's becoming harder and harder to give up the heat to that particular unit. So what we like to do with these particular um, systems especially if we are designing these to uh, satisfy a multifamily building, is we wanna make sure that the water coming back to that unit, uh, that outdoor unit is as cold as possible. So you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, this diagram here, we're pulling water from the bottom of that storage tank. That's where the connection to that outdoor unit is being made. Cause you know, if you look at, you know, our storage tanks, you know, when the water's sitting inside that tank waiting to go out to the building, there's going to be some stratification. You know, the hotter water is going to be lighter. It's going to rise to the top. The colder water is going to sink and it's going to congregate at the bottom. And that's where we want to pull our water from. We want to get it from the bottom of the tank so that we're bringing in the coldest possible water to that unit so that we can have the biggest temperature rise that we can achieve so that our efficiencies stay high. All right, so that's something that we'll talk about when we get into the installation standpoint is that, you know, we want this stratification to take place inside these tanks and we want to pull the coldest water from the bottom so that we can maintain that good delta T uh, between uh, the incoming water temperature and the outlet water temperature. Now, now that we talked about what kind of affects, you know, our, you know, performance for those two different types, let's jump into some of the installation requirements. 
So one of the things that we're going to talk through when it comes to the integrated heat pump water heaters is space, right? We talked a little bit about this before, you know, if we don't have enough space, you know, or enough air, volume of air, you know, in a particular location to harvest heat from, uh, we're going to have problems with performance. So most manufacturers of integrated heat pump water heaters want a minimum, you know, of 800 square feet. There are about, some of them are a thousand uh, cubic feet, I'm sorry, 800 cubic feet or a thousand cubic feet of space, you know, in order for these units to work correctly. And when you put them in, let's say a utility closet, you know, or, you know, a space that, you know, obviously it doesn't have a lot of, you know, of air in it, um, it's going to, you know, kind of exhaust that heat energy very, very quickly because it's going to be pulling in that air, it's going to be uh, absorbing the heat from it and it's going to be discharging this cold air and you know the overall temperature of that space is going to start to drop you know because we're effectively you know conditioning cooling that space and if there's not a lot of you know sort of regeneration of that heat through you know um through you know sort of internal gains we're going to have problems with performance because it's going to become harder and harder and harder for that unit to harvest heat so one of the things we need to pay attention to is those space requirements, making sure that we have enough air, air in that space that we can harvest heat from and making sure that there is some sort of regeneration process where we can go ahead and, um, and recoup that heat so that we can harvest it a little bit more. On the right hand side, placement is also important as well. You can see that this particular unit had its discharge placed right against the foundation wall of this particular home. And the issue with that is that you're going to be discharging cold air and as it hits that wall, it's going to bounce back and it's going to kind of start to recirculate back to the uh, the inlet on the opposite side of this particular unit. So that's also going to be important as well is where do we direct that cold air? We don't want to direct it to a, a mass, you know, some solid wall so that it ricochets and comes back because then we're going to start to recirculate that cold air and we're not going to be pulling in uh, warm air like we, like we have designed. So we need to make sure that we're discharging it out. It's getting away from the unit so that we can harvest, you know, this air that has a lot of heat energy in it so we can make our hot water. So those are two considerations when it comes to, um, to space uh, in terms of these integrated units. Mm -hmm. Now, the outdoor units uh, for our split systems also have requirements when it comes to um, space requirements, right? We still need to make sure that we can get airflow through these units as well, because again, the you know, same process is happening. We need to pull air in, we need to absorb heat from it, we need to discharge cold air out. So we do need to pay attention to where these units are located, how far are they, uh, you know, how close are they to uh, exterior walls? Um, do they have a good airflow pathway? And this is very similar to what you would do when you're citing a heat pump for space conditioning. We wanna make sure that there's, it's not, you know, behind a bunch of shrubs and, you know, it's, it has, you know, has good free airflow through it so that we can move as much heat energy through those coils as, as possible. So we want to make sure that's taking place. And then we also need to account for snow and, and a lot of, you know, you know, areas, these, these units are going to be operating year round, right? So the, we need, uh, we have a need for domestic hot water production all the time. And if we get a big you know, snowstorm where we have, you know, multiple feet of snow, we need to make sure that these units are above that anticipated snowfall amount. Uh, again, just like our uh, space conditioning heat pumps this way, they're not buried, you know, with snow, you know, during the winter time. Uh, we need to make sure that they have, you know, a good, you know, four to six inches off the ground, you know, or whatever it is above your anticipated snowfall amount. Uh, and that's going to allow them to um, be able to, you know, absorb heat effectively. Um, and again, just like the uh, integrated units, we're going to you know, create some condensate, uh, especially during humid days. Um, so we also need uh, to make provisions to have them up off the ground so that condensate can drain freely um, out of the units so we don't have an issue uh, with, uh, with freezing uh, on those coils. Another thing with these units um, that I'll mention here is also we also want to uh, minimize the length of piping. Uh, you know, the, the water piping that connects to these outdoor units, you know, again, because it's water, you know, we're circulating to the outdoors, we want to make sure that we're not, uh, it's not going to uh, freeze uh, that easily uh, in cold environments. So we want to make sure that it's insulated correctly, it's piped as short and direct as possible so that we don't have an issue with freezing. Um, and we may even take the step of putting in heat trace uh, in order for us to provide a little bit of heat uh, during times when the ambient temperature drops down uh, below freezing. Uh, we also have to worry about, again, I talked about space considerations as well. You know, where are these units sited? How far are they away from, you know, inside corners, outside corners, you know, all of those good things. And that's all in the manual. So just making sure that your contractors are following these installation best practices is going to be key. 
Now with the integrated units, they do also generate sound, right? We have a compressor operating, right? So you're gonna hear some of the, the noise that that compressor is making during operation. And, you know, it's not, you know, it's not, uh, you know, whisper quiet. It's not, you know, noticeably loud. It's kind of in, in the middle between, you know, a refrigerator and a vacuum. So it's about 55, you know, decibels is kind of what we've measured, um, 50 to 55 during normal operation. And, you know, one of the issues is if you are citing this in a living space, you know, maybe it's in, a, you know, a closet that has 800 cubic feet of space, but it's also, you know, with a louver door and it's right next to, you know, uh, the family room, you may want to think twice about that um, just because of the noise that it will create. Um, you know, maybe it's not as noticeable during the day when a lot of folks are active, but, you know, at nighttime, uh, you may hear it uh, much more, um, you know, more noticeably. Um, so we have to pay attention to the noise that they're going to create as well. So that we don't have um, you know, any complaints from the end user uh, when it comes to uh, normal operation. And then the last thing with the integrated units is that you know we are generating cold air. You know we, we talked about this from a, a performance you know aspect. You know that you know the colder the air, the you know the harder it is to harvest heat. Uh, but if we are you know sending heat you know, cold air out to the space, we're also going to you know um, possibly have some comfort issues um, as well when it comes to where we're we directing that airflow. Again, if we're installing this in a conditioned space that is you know um, that is up you know in near a living area, we may start to send that. Cold cold air out uh, to that living space, which then may generate complaints, um, you know, with the occupants uh, that, you know, the space is cold and drafty because the heat pump uh, water heater is now uh, providing, you know, cooling, you know, during the winter time. Um, this also has an implication on, you know, space temperature as well. You know, again, this is not a great installation, you know, having this unit in a very small closet. Um, this unit was going off on uh, low temperature. It wasn't able to maintain uh, the proper amount of domestic hot water temperature inside the tank you know, due to the temperatures inside this closet dropping. So uh, this uh, particular um, occupant uh, was uh, a little innovative and, and put a space heater uh, inside of this closet to generate more heat so that the heat pump can utilize that to make hot water. Um, so again, you know, talking about COPs dropping, this is a huge uh, reduction in coefficient of performance um, if we're utilizing a space heater to generate heat so that we could harvest it to make hot water. Um, so again, we need to pay attention to all those things when we're citing these units. Again, condensate will happen with these units. We have to make sure that we're managing it. So, um, you know, a lot of times that's done through a condensate pump. Um, so water will, you know, be produced during this process. That condensate will drain to a pump, and then we're going to pump that off to a uh, to a sink or to a drain, something nearby where we can manage that. So that's something we do want to see as well. Um, if those pumps do fail, uh, and they do, over time, maybe the float gets stuck or, you know, they uh, the motor burns out. You know, we want to see these... Um, tanks installed in a pan so we can contain that condensate if that pump happens to overflow. And we also want them a little bit up on blocks. This way, if we do have that pan filled with water, um, if it's not drained out like this one, you can see it's capped. Um, we would we don't want that you know unit to be sitting in a, in a pond of water um, you know, until it evaporates. So those are a couple of things we also have to pay attention to. When it comes to the outdoor units, uh, the split systems, another thing we do have to, again, manage is the condensate for these as well. Um, so again, we talked about keeping them up, you know, four to six inches off of the ground, so this way the condensate can drain. Um, and we also need to make sure that the condensate is directed to a place where it's not going to cause a slip and fall hazard, right? We don't want these units to be um, installed, you know, in close proximity to, let's say, a walkway or a driveway, where that now, if the condensate is produced and it drains out, and during the defrost cycle, we don't don't want it to refreeze on those on those walkways or those areas. So you know, citing these is going to be important as well. Um, that we have uh, clear access to condensate drainage, um, and we're preventing it from refreezing. Uh, yeah, this is what we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, I mentioned is you know making sure those pipe lengths are as short and direct as possible because we don't want those um, we don't want to have a high potential you know for those water pipes to freeze. Um, so we want to make sure that there is you know insulation. There's insulation is protected on these units, especially if it doesn't have an integrated UV barrier. We don't want that insulation of the pipes to degrade over time and to fall apart. And we want to make sure that it's protected with you know some sort of you know uh, UV shield. Um, and that uh, it is, you know, insulated throughout the entire length with you know, the appropriate um, R level, R, R value for, the, for our insulation. And then again, we can install, you know, heat trace as well. 
Um, so if we have, you know, uh, longer runs uh, where we are, you know, feeling that there may be um, an issue with those pipes potentially freezing, we can install, you know, heat trace, which then will be, you know, sort of temperature activated. As the temperature outside drops, we're going to send, you know, a trickle amount of electricity to this resistive um, strip that is going to allow that those pipes to stay warm uh, and above freezing so that we don't have uh, a freeze issue when our demand is low, right? So that is also uh, recommended as well for cold climates. And then, you know, we want to make sure that we are, uh, you know, detailing those plumbing connections, right? Uh, or those piping connections as we, you know, you know, we detail that going through our, our wall assembly. Obviously, we're going to do something more robust, you know, than this uh, when it comes to our passive house projects. So we, we want to make sure that we are, we do have the proper gaskets and we're, and we're looking at, uh, you know, any type of, you know, of air sling detail when it comes to, you know, how do these pipes pass through the enclosure? How are we going to detail them? How are we going to make sure they stay airtight, um, insulated well, for, prevent thermal bridges, you know, all of those things need to be considered um, as those pipes, you know, penetrate through the enclosure. Again, same thing you would be doing uh, as you're detailing the refrigerant pipes for your uh, space conditioning appliances. Uh, and then also the internal, you know, um, you know, uh, hot water piping, we do want to insulate that as well. Obviously, um, especially in a passive house project, we're really concerned about making sure that we're not wasting, we're not shedding a lot of heat from uh, these units. Um, so any of the domestic hot water piping that is going out to the building, we want to make sure that it is insulated with the proper um, insulation thickness so that we can minimize, you know, those standby losses and those distribution losses that we may experience as the water's traveling from the unit uh, to uh, the fixtures. And then taking that, you know, sort of a step further, we also like to see um, heat traps installed as well uh, on both the hot and cold side of the connections to our unit, um, especially the integrated units like this. Anytime we have, you know, a volume of water that's sitting there, um, let's say overnight when the draw profile is, you know, is pretty much, you know, zero, uh, we have, uh, there's a tendency of to that water to start to migrate. The hot water tends to migrate into the cold water side and through the hot water piping, right? Because that hot water that's sitting there becomes lighter and it's going to want to move its way up. And because we have our tappings for our cold connection here to this unit on the top, that hot water starts to rise up and it starts to displace the cold water inside of those pipes and they start to, to get warm. And you see this, any type of standalone, you know, water heater that's out there, you know, in the market, if you, you know, have it off for a period of time and you go and grab the cold side of that, you know, piping connection, guarantee it's going to be hot, right? Uh, water is going to be migrating up. So to prevent that and to prevent, you know, the associated, you know, distribution loss, right? Because the cold water pipes may not be insulated, right? And if they're not insulated, then, you know, we're going to be losing heat to the ambient air. We want to see something like this, uh, a heat trap installed, an inverted trap this way that it makes it very difficult for that, um, that warm water to migrate out into the cold water supply because of that trap that is installed. Um, so that's just good plumbing practice um, and but we want to see it because again we're trying to reduce any of those um, standby losses that we may experience uh, when we're operating these types of units. Uh, the next thing is going to be wiring, right? So we need to make sure that these units have um, a sufficient, you know, um, wiring is done in a, in, a, in a sufficient way. It's, you know, following the code and, and best practices. So we want to see that we have good overcurrent protection. So the breakers are properly sized, they're properly labeled. Um, so that if we do need to service the unit or if there is an emergency, we want to make sure that we have access to um, those breakers and they are labeled correctly. Uh, we want to make sure that the electrician is following the best practices when it comes to you know wire uh, sizing in terms of gauge and and uh, insulation conductor ins insulation to make sure that you know we have a good safe connection to these units because again it is a little different especially from a, a retrofit application where you were running you know a um, a gas fired standalone water heater you know that didn't need electricity you know we had you know a pi pilot let's say and we had a gas valve and you know away we went as the temperature dropped. Um, but if the with these units we have to provide electricity, so we need to make sure that we have you know a proper circuit that is you know going from our panel to our to our unit, and we're we're following best you know electrical practices so that we um, have a safe operating unit here. Uh, the same thing with uh, disconnects. We want a mean of, means of disconnect. We want to be able to be able to de-energize the unit locally in case we have to perform service, change filters, whatever it may be, and we feel more comfortable de-energizing the unit. Uh, we recommend uh, fusible disconnects like this. 
uh, which can be installed locally um, at the unit, uh, whether it's integrated or, you know, if it is a split unit, we would install this, you know, um, on the outside with uh, a whip that would go to the outdoor unit to provide power. Um, but again, having a fuse disconnect is a good idea. Uh, and again, local code is typically going to require a means of disconnect at the, at the unit. When it comes to, to maintenance requirements, uh, there's a couple of things that we have to pay attention to. Uh, again, we are sending air across evaporator coil. And, you know, especially during times when the indoor air is moist, we're going to have water on that coil. Uh, and we don't want any dust or debris that is inside the air, you know, attaching to that coil uh, and reducing the airflow through that particular evaporator. So we have filters in place, just like we would, you know, for a space conditioning device. And those filters require maintenance. You know, we need to make sure that we're maintaining those filters, whether they're replaceable or whether they're washable. Uh, again, this is, you know, um, you know, sort of knowledge that needs to be transferred to the end user to make sure that, you know, these uh, filters are being maintained. And a lot of times they need to be changed or washed, you know, on a monthly basis. And this is something, again, is not you know, common with most water heating devices. It's in the basement, it does its job, we don't have to really worry about it too much, right? Uh, but with these units, we do have some maintenance considerations and, and changing filters is gonna be one of those because we wanna make sure uh, that we have good airflow uh, through that evaporator coil so that we're not relying, especially with these, on that electric resistive heat uh, to provide domestic hot water to the space. So again, good at homeowner, homeowner education is gonna be critical here. With the split units, uh, we do also have to clean them, right? So we have coils that are sitting outside, you know, just like we have with our space conditioning devices. And you know, eventually they're gonna get dirty as well. You know, there's a lot of dust debris outside and we're drawing that air in, it's going to attach to those outdoor coils. So it is a good idea on a annual basis, whether it's, you know, a homeowner or whether it's a contractor to perform, you know, these coil cleanings. Um, and uh, typically you're gonna use some sort of coil cleaning solution that'll be sprayed on the outer coil, which will start to dislodge all the dirt and debris that is, you know, sitting there. Um, once that is uh, kind of does its job, you'll take a, you know, a spray, um, you know, device, whether it's, you know, a handheld sprayer like this or a garden hose with not a lot of pressure. We don't want to use too much pressure, just enough to wash all that, you know, coil cleaning solution off so that we can dislodge all that dirt and debris. Again, we're trying to maintain good airflow through that particular coil so that we have uh, the ability to harvest as much heat as possible uh, from that outdoor air. Um, so this again is typically required on a annual basis uh, and again can be performed you know, by an uh, end user or you know, could be performed by a contractor. But uh, we do wanna make sure that those uh, coils stay clean. Um, and you know, that's you know, most of the maintenance requirements with these units you know, for the most part. It's just really making sure the coils stay clean uh, we have good airflow through them. You know, as long as they're sited properly and you know they're installed correctly, um, the maintenance you know shouldn't be too much of a burden. It's just really making sure that we have good heat exchange. So, so with that, uh, we have a couple minutes left. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm sure we have a few that have come through the the chat box. Um, and uh, yeah, anyone have any questions about anything that we covered? Yeah, thanks, Adam. There are a couple. Uh, there are a few in here that we can just run through. Um, sure. Would you comment on whether um, folks should consider oversizing a heat pump water uh, heater so that the electric element doesn't have to kick in as often? Yeah, so that is one of the things that we found through the implementation project um, was that uh, units that were a little bit bigger in terms of the total volume of the, the tank um, performed a, a little better because they had a bigger reservoir of hot water uh, inside them. So, you know, a lot of manufacturers do recommend, you know, figure out, you know, um, you know, your recovery rate, what you need to provide, and then your first hour rating, and then you know, size the tank of one size bigger um, to really make sure that you have enough reserve so that we don't utilize a lot of the electric resistive um, little, uh, elements. Um, the other thing we found besides making them a little bit bigger was if we set the temperature hotter uh, than 120 and utilize the mixing valve, uh, we also reduce the, the total draw from the tank as well. So let's say if we had the tank sitting there at 140 degrees, but we wanted 120 going out to the building, we have you know all this you know this battery, this hot water sitting there. Um, but as we pass it through a mixing valve, we're bringing in cold water from the city to bring it down to 120. So the total volume that is going out to the building is you know is a you know addition equation, right? You have part part of it's coming from the tank, part of it's coming from the city, and that blended water goes out to the building. So we're reducing again the total consumption in terms of volume on that tank 
tank by sending out hotter water and utilizing a mixing valve to, to mix it down. Uh, but good point. Um, that's again, that those are the two recommendations that did come out of that study to kind of improve performance. And then related to that, do, do you have any any insight into how the cost of operation, like the, the water output compares when it's running um, full heat pump mode versus electric resistance, like how that um, efficiency or, or cost for this generation compares? Yeah, no, the cost is obviously going to be higher when it's running with electric resistive, right? So not, you know, the performance, the COP is going to drop. Um, so we're going to be, you know, the unit is going to essentially become a straight electric resistive you know, heat pump, uh, or a straight electric resistive water heater. Um, so, you know, however many kilowatts go into that, you know, uh, that resistive element, you know, that's going to be your, 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 your charge, you know, per hour as it's, as it's being consumed. So, you know, obviously, you know, the cost will be higher when operating that electric resistive. So we want to kind of make sure that the heat pump is is operating you know as much as it can um, because we want to see those COPs of two or three or four so this way we don't have to you know utilize so much electricity to get the same you know sort of output and obviously we're mainly focused here on uh, uh, in Connecticut but uh, do, do you think climate zone should factor into uh, applicability of heat pump water heaters in terms of uh, conditioned space, ambient air, uh, and, and those types of elements. Yeah, I mean a little bit. I mean, I think with the integrated units, um, you know, you're, you know, you have, um, it, you know, the air temperature is much more controlled, right? Because it's in. If you have it in a conditioned space and. In a lot of passive house projects, you know, we have sometimes trouble with internal gains, right? You know, we have, you know, a higher percentage of cooling uh, than we do uh, heating uh, because of, you know, we have such a great you know, building enclosure. Uh, and anything that is, you know, sort of generating heat is, you know, it's not really being dissipated through the enclosure as much. Um, so I think, you know, it's a little bit less, you know, you know, effect, you know, or sort of a, of a factor when you have the integrated units that are sited indoors, as long as they're in a good location where you have some residual heat that you can absorb. Um, when it comes to the split units, you know, obviously, yeah, I mean, the colder climates, you're going to have, um, you know, a higher, you know, sort of electric, you know, consumption because, you know, it's going to be harder to harvest heat um, from the from that cold uh, temperature. So, you know, we should look at, you know, uh, different, you know, units, uh, you know, installation factors and sizes just to make sure that, you know, we are providing, you know, a, a sufficient domestic hot water, even when it gets, gets really, really cold. Um, the units that we showcased, you know, we pretty much had zero capacity loss down to five degrees. But if you're in a really cold climate where, you know, you go below zero, you know, for a high percentage of time, not to say it won't work, it's just you may need to, to figure out the sizing uh, to make sure you have an additional reservoir, uh, just like we did with the integrated tanks, have more of a battery inside um, to kind of, you know, weather the storm when you have those really cold ambient temperatures. Yeah, great. Um, how does the cost for heat pump water heaters, the upfront cost, compare to traditional um, standard water tanks or uh, tankless? Uh, and how long do they typically last? You know, we know that the standard tanks, they usually have a 10 to 12 year, 8 to 12 year life. So how do those compare? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, with the integrated uh, water heaters, you know, because you don't have, um, you know, a direct flame on the on the tank itself, you know, you have, you know, pretty much, pretty much the same or even longer, you know, in terms of working life, um, because there's not as much really affecting it in terms of, um, you know, sort of heat thermal stress. Um, so, you know, the tank types, is, and even with, you know, the split systems, you know, those storage tanks are, you know, can last, you know, a good 10, 15 years, um, you know, because we're, again, we're just circulating hot water to them, um, as opposed to, you know, having a direct flame under them. Uh, the first cost is going to be a little bit higher because you're paying for that, you know, uh, the refrigeration circuit, especially when you're looking at electric resistive as a um, as a comparison. Those are fairly inexpensive units. Um, so, you know, going to a heat pump, you know, water heater is going to be a premium. There's going to be a first cost premium, uh, but arguably you're going to save, you know, sort of operating costs and, you know, it should you know work out in terms of, a, you know, cost benefit analysis. Um, with fuel units, again, these are going to be more expensive than your, you know, traditional natural gas fired units. Um, but uh, it depends on you know you know your electrical rate and you know uh, and you know and all of those different factors in terms of how the costs compare in terms of operational cost. Um, but uh, but it saves you know from new construction perspective in a passive house project it saves from not having to run uh, you know a vented appliance you know and, and things like that. 
Um, the uh, instantaneous units, uh, those do require a lot of energy. That's the only you know, downside about the instantaneous water heaters. If, even if you look at the electrical ones, um, sometimes they require a 19 kW, you know, or 20 kW, 50 kW circuits. Um, so you may be using, you know, half of your, you know, available electrical capacity to try to, you know, bring water in at 55 and heat it up to 120, you know, through this very small instantaneous unit. Um, so they typically have a very, you know, high, um, you know, sort of in, uh, BTU input requirement, whether that's electrical input or, or, or you know, fuel input. Um, so they, they end up, you know, costing sometimes a little bit more if you have um, buildings that have a lot of, or homes that have a lot of utilization, um, you know, a lot of draw um, that can cause them to, especially the instantaneous draw, that can cause them to, you know, to become a little bit less uh, of cost effective from the operational standpoint. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of the time, you know, they are going to be a bit of a premium uh, when it comes to your first cost. Uh, so we're coming right up here on one o'clock, but there are a couple quick questions I want to get mm -hmm. to if we, if we can. Um, sure. I think this one would be quick, but if you're a builder for builders or, or HVAC installers out there or anyone else, um, if they want to compare the energy usage of a heat pump water heater to other options, whether that be delivered fuel or, or uh, otherwise, um, how, how would you suggest they go about doing that uh, comparison or analysis? Yeah, there's a, a good, there's, I think uh, DOE has a, a few a few tools. So if you go into the Department of Energy's website and look at, um, you know, heat pump water heaters, I think they have a tool in there where you can put in cost information, uh, put in, you know, sort of size and, you know, in some parameters, and then it can give you sort of a cost comparison based on your rates, right? Because, you know, obviously the, the rates are going to be uh, a big impact in terms of, um, you know, how these things are going to operate, you know, long term, right? Um, if you're in an area where you have, you know, high, you know low gas, you know, cost and, and high electric rates, Rates, you know, it may not pencil out from an operational standpoint. So um, you're going to have to look at, you know, the efficiencies, um, the rate, uh, and then um, then really look at, okay, well, how, what is the, the expected usage in terms of uh, performance and then figure out those analysis. But I believe there is a tool on Department of Energy's website that does that for you. Great. Um, with split systems, is there any issues with uh, distance from the from the outdoor unit mm -hmm. to the indoor unit, and you know any considerations about um, you know yeah. refrigerant or, or freezing along the, the lines there? Yeah, so there is going to be uh, considerations, and it's mostly vertical lift is the issue. Um, so, you know, you have to, there's a pump that is integrated into the split unit that is going to be, you know, drawing water off of that tank and then sending heated water back to that tank. Um, and if we have um, to overcome vertical lift and the longer distances, um, those pumps, you know, may not be able to provide enough head pressure uh, to do that. Um, so you have to look at um, the lengths, and manufacturers will provide guidance as to, you know, how far the, the water connections can be, how many 90s, what is the total equivalent length, all those good things um, to make sure that the pump that is installed can work well in that application. But that is a good point as well. You do have to consider the distance between the outdoor unit and the tank uh, when it comes to um, the pump performance. And is there a manufacturer spec that says that the outdoor unit can't be put into a semi-conditioned space like a basement or somewhere else? No, and we've seen that a lot. Um, and we've done that on a few projects here in New York City where we've um, put those units inside um, because we've had a, you know spaces that uh, could, you know, you know we could, where we could utilize that heat um, and we might want to send it somewhere else. Um, so we've looked into, you know, uh, rooms in, in buildings that have steam rooms and with district steam applications where we've installed those units um, to harvest a lot of the waste heat that's there um, so you can get creative i know i've worked with colleagues that have done it in parking garages in multifamily buildings to pick up heat from cars that are you know sitting there you know engine block is hot there's a lot of residual heat you can pick up to provide um, you know domestic hot water so you can get creative as to where you can put these uh, and and think outside the box when it comes to you know uh, absorbing any any waste heat Great. And last one, since we're a few minutes over now, um, do you have any comments or experience with uh, using air, so uh, excuse me, heat pump water heaters in air to water uh, situations? For space conditioning? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, it's just, uh, you have to be careful. I mean, the, the capacities for these units are not that large, you know, especially, you know, um, the, uh, because it's really designed to, you know, to satisfy your your, your uh, domestic hot water load. So when it gets into, you know, space conditioning loads, those loads are going to be a lot higher. Um, and, you know, you have to pay attention to the temperatures that they can produce. Um, you know, most hydronic applications uh, that are conventional, you require 180 degree water to, to operate, you know, during design 
underlying conditions. Um, and, you know, these units are not going to be able to provide, you know, that, you know, in most cases. Um, uh, but there are bigger units that are, you know, show promise that are coming into the U.S. market. Um, and, uh, you know, we're looking to see how we can implement those in, you know, low temperature uh, distribution applications where we can possibly utilize an air to water heat pump to do that. Uh, but uh, but those would need to be higher capacity. Uh, and we're, you know, we're kind of experimenting with a few new ones that are coming into the U.S. market. I think over time, more will come in and we'll have more options, but right now the options are a little bit limited. Great. Um, well, there were, uh, we didn't get to everyone's questions. If you do have other questions you, you'd like us to answer, please feel free to reach out to the email address there at the bottom of the, the slide and we can collaborate with Adam to get you answers on those. But other than that, Adam, thanks so much for your time. This is super helpful. I'll let Anna um, remind folks about where they can get the recording and any sort of uh, CEUs as well. So great. Thanks yeah. again, everyone. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Yeah, quick reminder, if you do want to get AIA or BPI CEUs, we'll be sending out a survey in an email. Um, so make sure to fill out that survey to get the CEUs. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone. Bye.